Okay, Think Tech Asia, the one o'clock block on a given Tuesday. I'm here with Roger Epstein, uh, who is a lawyer, who a tax lawyer, but who has done a lot of work in China. And that's why we're talking about Belt and Road, the Belt and Road Initiative, formerly known as One Belt, One and One Road. Yes. That's changed, though, because you could not argue this is one belt and one road. This is many belts and many roads. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it girds the earth. Yeah, just about. Girds the earth. At least the earth as far as Asia and uh, I think even some parts of Africa and uh, Europe. We are not part of that earth. Yeah, so let's talk first in the first part of our show about what, what it's doing, who's involved, how it works. The second part of our show, let's talk about uh, the American participation or not. And if not, what effect on the U.S.? You know, because this is a global initiative. Yeah. So uh, I guess it was uh, 2013, Xi Jinping decided going to do this. And actually, in my view, it followed on what he did with CCTV. CCTV was a China news network in China, and he decided, or they decided, back in the early, the aught years, uh, to make it global. And they did. They made the China news network or something. And there are 44 stations now all over the world. Mm. And they are pumping out uh, pro China news all over the world. Yeah. Um, so they became global in terms of the information and propaganda. Um, and that, w that worked. So then this follows. This is economic development all over the world. Right. You know. Right. Oh, yes. And, and uh, it, the, the, the overall picture is here's places where there isn't adequate infrastructure, either by land, autos, rail, trucking, uh, or by sea, which is the road, so uh, maritime. So the, the grand scheme of the Chinese is to uh, lend money and uh, build out the infrastructure in all these different countries so that you uh, recapture the Silk Road, the old Silk Road from China to across Europe. And a uh, uh, very, very incredibly big uh, undertaking. And in my mind, very thoughtful, as I think the Chinese are in, in economic matters. Uh, it's visionary. Visionary. It looks ahead 100 years. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, uh, we'll talk about this uh, uh, before, uh, later on when we talk about the United States, but I, I taught in a uh, uh, university in Beijing uh, last, uh, last year for four months. And what I found was, uh, what I've seen since I've been going there, at least uh, this last iteration from 2007 on, tremendous optimism, tremendous looking forward to the future. You know, China had literally no written laws until 1983. You couldn't own personal property or real estate. You couldn't own anything from 1949 to 1978, going on 80 maybe. So the change from Mao died in 76, uh, 77, 78, they had the Gang of Four fighting for power. Deng Xiaoping, who was a Zhou Enlai protege, took over and he began to open up uh, China to capitalism, essentially. And so... Uh, that was, now, that was a pivot of major magnitude. Oh, for the whole world. It was yeah, huge. Yeah. And they brought 700 million people out of poverty with this. Yeah. So uh, they started with uh, uh, letting you buy real estate. Imagine if in 1980 you were able to buy real estate in Shanghai and build a shopping center. And now you've rolled that over seven times. That's why China has more billionaires than anybody else in the world now. Then they got into manufacturing, as you know. That was the low-cost manufacturing. Uh, and now it, they're too expensive. So the low cost has gone other places. And the factories are stepping up to a little higher quality, a little higher uh, a type of product. Uh, and what you also have in China is... Uh, and somebody told me this uh, some years ago. Once you have $3,000 of income a year, you can begin to be a consumer. <laughs> so the third rung of the Chinese uh, uh, economic growth is consumerism, which we have been on forever. We know how to do that. We know how to do that. And it looks like we're kind of <laughs> tapped out. If last Christmas was, uh, I, you know, we're a matured environment. 
But this economic. sounds like the fourth run. You know, the Xi Jinping initiative, Belt and Road, is, is beyond anything that's happened so far. That's true. It's an expansion of China's uh, economic success everywhere. Yeah. And, and it's opening the way to Chinese goods being sold along the Belt and sure, Road. Sure. Yeah. So you can make a pretty good argument that, uh, you know, this vision works for every place it touches, uh, theoretically. Um, you know, we're talking about healthcare, we're talking about energy, we're talking about transportation, we're, we're talking about, gee, everything. Yeah. Uh, I could go on. And, and the result is that, that a country which was an uh, undeveloped country, you know, at the bottom of the ladder, yeah. all of a sudden... 35 years ago, almost less than 40 years ago. I mean, I'm talking now. Yeah. At the bottom oh, of I the see. ladder. Like an African country. Right. With Belt Road, all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's a modern first world country. It has the technology. It has the communications. It has everything you need to step right up. And this can happen right away through Chinese investment. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a and, huge plan. And couldn't it, uh, couldn't it also bring many African countries out of poverty and their citizens? How Absolutely. many hundreds of millions of people are we talking about with that possibility? All of whom will like China. All of whom will have positive, um, you know, uh, uh, foreign, foreign connection, uh, you know, diplomatic connections with China. And I think this is a kind of a new imperialism. It's a soft, very soft power, soft imperialism. But it, it, it cements China's position on a geopolitical basis everywhere it touches, everywhere it raises people up. And all boats are being raised. They're all being raised in favor of China. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question about it. China is becoming the economic power in the world. They're number two to the United States. And we've decided to go insular, and they've decided to go outwards. And now keep in mind uh, that one of the things that's also happening, a big complaint about this, is that China's kind of forcing this, not so much forcing, but it's almost what the World Bank has been accused of many times, giving people infrastructure, they can't really pay for it, uh, then they become big uh, debtors of China, and also, Many of the projects, uh, once they start, they bring a ton of Chinese uh, employees and workers down there. And so there's a lot of discussion and a lot of negativity about maybe China's really in it for China. And um, uh, are, are the other countries getting out of it uh, what they should be? And, and uh, are they paying attention yeah. uh, to the local people yeah. as they should? Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe it's dynamic. You know, hopefully Xi Jinping learns by his errors. The, the, the Sri Lanka case is a good example of an error, yeah. uh, in, my, in my view. Uh, he, he, he built a harbor for them. Uh -huh. uh, they couldn't afford the harbor. It's huge billions of dollars. There's no money in Sri Lanka. Uh, so they defaulted, and then he wound up owning the harbor, right. um, which is right. not very good. So it's, right. it's, uh, it's um, you know, uh, the debt trap. They call it the debt trap. You know, you know, Jay, uh, uh, I, I first went to China in 1982. I'd been going to Hong Kong for, for years before that. started in 74. In 1982, China was clearly a third world country. Everybody riding around on bicycles. The cars were honking and, and nobody was making any money. Uh, China had literally opened up in 76 when, uh, when the Queen said they're going to give Hong Kong back. And then a lot of manufacturing moved there. So we're still in a pretty low state of uh, uh, development. Uh, then I went back in 94 and spent some time with, in, in some economic conferences and the level of sophistication was much higher. And uh, the Chinese were learning, okay? And, uh, and then uh, uh, the, it was still kind of basic. Somebody came back after that meeting and wanted to get money from Hawaii to build uh, an electric power plant. And they gave me a four page paper, you know, as a prospectus. And basically what it said is, we got a lot of people, we don't have electric power, would you please give us $3 million so we can build a plant? <laughs> and I know- It's uh, a cheap plant. A cheap plant. <laughs> and, well, it was in China in those days, and it was cheap. Uh, uh, and then, uh, 2007, I started going there on a very regular basis and taking lawyers to come back and stay at my law firm's office. and. And I began to see a much, much higher level of sophistication. And I would say today 
uh, that Chinese lawyers and businessmen are 90% of what we would want here, maybe 85, 90%. So China learns. They learn, they grow. They have more students educated in the United States than it far and away. And I, I was up at Columbia University uh, earlier this year, or last year, and uh, you walk around, not only do you see a lot of Chinese, you hear Chinese spoken everywhere. So uh, the Chinese are optimistic, they're enthusiastic, uh, they see a huge bright future. They're on this, this streak up. And we talk about, oh, you know, the economy's suffering. Well, it, it went from 10% to 8 to 6 to 4. Still a pretty good growth rate. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and unrestrained growth is, is unworkable anyway. Yeah. So I see the Belt and Road as a huge opportunity for China to see, yes, geopolitically as well as economically. I mean, think about it. This road starts in China, goes all the way across parts of Africa into uh, Europe. South America. Don't forget South America. Yes, yes. And so uh, uh, they're really saying, let's work together. Then you're going to have treaties, you're going to have economic treaties, you're going to have all kinds of relationships that kind of cut the United States out to a great yeah, extent. Yeah. So, well, you know, what's interesting is that they're trying to be, as you say, they're trying to learn every step of the way because they're building something that has never been built before. Yes. This is bigger, better, more visionary than any project anywhere by any country ever in the world. And they're trying to build it, in, in my view, uh, systematically and smart. One thing that really caught my eye, Roger, is, mm. is that in Wuhan, they have established a law school mm -hmm. that is dedicated to one belt, one road. Really? It's a law school that teaches the law in every place they want to go. So you got to do that, right? If you're Amazing. going to make investments, Amazing. if you're going to make partnerships, yeah. if you're going to do loans, if you can do management, you have to know what the law is in that place. So you, you teach the students in this special law school what it's like all over the world. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, uh, 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 yes, they're, they really see the future. They're working at it in an intelligent way. They have a long range view. Uh, I think, you know, we're still 10, 15 years away from this being in a, a you know, a really significant uh, path for commerce. Mm. But uh, I just went to a lecture the other day where a lawyer uh, in China and Hawaii connected to, with Hawaii said uh, their 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 economy is going to be bigger than ours in the next five years. Well, I think you have to fold in the Belt and Road into their economy. In other words, yes. right now, or at least uh, up till recently, their economy has been within the boundaries of China. I think mostly, um, but with Belt One Belt One Road, it'll be global, and it'll right. every single every single project you know, that they do or manage in other countries, you have to consider part of their economy, right? Yeah. So one of the interesting points about this is that you mentioned a minute ago is that it's, it's, it's loans. It's yes. loans. Yes, yes. It's not necessarily investments. But I think if Xi Jinping is learning, he's going to figure out that he has to do both. And the question, oh, and, and you mentioned also that the money comes from China. But I think he's going to learn, he is learning, it's happening already, that the money isn't limited to money that comes from China, he's, he's going to, he is setting it up so the investors come from everywhere. Yes. And Hong Kong is a big part of that. That's why this program yesterday, the Hong Kong Business Association, uh, which is actually uh, all across the world, mm -hmm. and, and they, they take the view that Hong Kong is and will continue to be a funnel for money, for investment money into China. Yeah. So that money comes from everywhere. It has come for the past 20 years, oh, long before that, you know, 20 years uh, since the turnover. Uh, it has come from everywhere, and it will continue to come from everywhere, and they would like it to continue to come from everywhere, but that money is, is global money, and he gets to manage, China gets to manage how that money is, is, is either loaned out or invested. This is tremendous power, not only over his capital, but capital from everywhere. And can you imagine the deals he's going to try to work with other places to make sure that they do put the money in? What about... Uh, the countries that are doing well now in Asia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, he'll have a tremendous amount of leverage to say, I want you to invest here. I want you to do this. And of course, in China, the government controls everything. The government controls the business. Uh, they even have 
some companies, uh, some government officers have uh, their own companies to do entrepreneurial kind of relationships with the private sector. So uh, it is geopolitical, no question about that. And it's going to be very uh, powerful. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to see how China opens up. Remember, you couldn't own property there until 1980 or, or around that period, 79, 80. And uh, now it's loosened up. So uh, all kinds of things are, are happening everywhere, including this Belt and Road. How are you going to do the Belt and Road if you keep the renminbi uh, from, from leaving the country? Mm. So yeah, and how are you going to do the Belt and Road in a, in a way that foreign countries, uh, you know, third world countries will accept your advice and your, your help um, when you have repression going on at home, yeah. when you have Chinese people leaving China because they don't like the repression, right. when you have the uh, social, what is it called, the social score uh, based on everything you do, an invasion of your privacy as no other country on earth has. Right. Those things are they're, they're contradictory. Not to so, mention the pollution. Not to mention that's the going to be spread. You yeah. know, in Laos, there's a big, several big dams built so that China can have more water, and uh, uh, they built those dams. But it flooded a lot of farmlands, and so there's going to China's going to get all this backlash. They're there's going to no have to be very about. respectful of the environment and human rights and uh, employee rights, human resources, human, you know, uh, uh, well, all the rights that go in a, in a first world country these days. And so, yeah. you know, what, what's going to happen is, I think, I yeah. think, and I'm being optimistic here, that China has a fabulous program. It is going to learn. It is going to morph. It is going to see change that program into an even more fabulous program for itself. Yeah. It's going to change in the process. How do you like that for an optimistic I, I, view? I, I agree with you. I think they have to change to, to be more open and more. China doesn't even call themselves communists anymore. They say we're socialists with Chinese characteristics. That's the term that they call themselves. Right. Although they did uh, build a statue in Germany for Karl Marx on his 200th <laughs> anniversary of his death. Uh, but, but, you know, things are going to change. And, and if you, in my, uh, uh, my mind, they're so effective. It's, it's like a, a, more than a benevolent dictatorship. It's more than that. It's a thoughtful, one-dimensional government uh, that uh, has, its, has its big fear that they're going to lose their control. Right. So uh, maybe that makes them more thoughtful to maybe. worry about. Yeah, that. at least they're thoughtful about it because people, there's, there's a lot of people in China, and it's hard to control 1.3 billion people. You have people. to keep them happy. At some level, you have to keep them happy. So let's take a, a, a one minute and, and be happy. Okay. Uh, for a little break. We I can be happy for a minute. I mean, I've been happy all day. Person. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. You know. So when we come back, I want to talk about the U.S. and how all of this affects or is affected by yeah. the United States yes. in its present form and how it might change. Yes. We'll Very right good. Back. That sounds fascinating. I'll be back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Yukari Kunisue the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii, Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show and is streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. I'm so happy to be happy. I'm so happy to be here with uh, Roger Epstein, and we're talking about China. We're talking about One Belt One Road, and this is the part of the show where we compare what happens there with what happens here, because here, you know, the world order is changing. China is a bigger part of it every day, and the U.S. seems to be a smaller part of it. <laughs> so, um, what, 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 how do you see the status of the United States here in the global order these days? Well, I think the United States is still, despite shooting ourselves in the foot over and over again, 
uh, the dominant player in the world, the, the place where people want to be, the, the, uh, the goal. When I taught in China uh, last, just last year, uh, the students, you know, they're all wearing th the statements. In it. I was teaching at a law school, a Chinese law school, uh, English, uh, 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 legal writing in English using American case law. Mm. And, wow. and so I, to me, China it sees the United States as where they want to be. Now, things are definitely changing. And uh, the Trump administration has decided uh, what's in it for us. We need to protect ourselves. We, I think that's exactly where you don't want to be as the world changes. You want to be part of the change. Uh, uh, talking about the Belt and Road, we had a competing kind of uh, project uh, with uh, many of the leading, the, the, the larger, more established uh, capitalist countries over there called uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm. Uncle Donald got us out of that. Uh, so now we don't even have, we don't have anything. And some of those players are trying to reform the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Some of them are talking to China. Certainly, uh, we're out of it. So it leaves all those countries to work together. If China is successful in building the Belt and Road, and as it, as, as it gains more credibility, if it is successful in its movements down different belts and roads, as you say, then that's going to encourage other people to work with them. And... Uh, and, tra and Trans-Pacific Partnership is already way smaller than Belt right. and Road. Right, right. They, they've got hundreds of billions involved. We've got hundreds of millions. Oh, they, Trans-Pacific Partnership has hundreds of millions. There's really no comparison as to the size and leverage well, of the two. Well, it's got billions, but, but we're talking trillions with the Belt and Road. Yes, we are. So, uh, so where are we and what are we doing? You know, uh, we're trying to... Uh, at a national level, we're trying to recreate what we had before, manufacturing and, and uh, uh, lower level pay. But really, what I see when I go in to, the, to China, what they want from us is our technology. Now, people say, oh, they're stealing our technology. Well, they, they, have, to, they have been, but they're getting better. The legal system is getting better there. And, and my thinking and what I've been trying to work with is, you enter into a partnership with somebody. If this guy's got these capacities and what you have is technology, you ought to be working with the people who can build the new products, who can uh, uh, collaborate with you instead of saying we're going to have a trade war with you. Uh, the trade war, I think, is so damaging to the United States, uh, not only in China, but Europe. Uh, we were talking, I don't know if they actually did it, they were going to give soybean farmers $60 billion in, in free money because they lost all their business in, in uh, China. And who's going to take that over? It's not just the, they've got to find other sources of suppliers. They Are those not. suppliers going to go away when, when we end the trade war? I don't know. All I'm saying is, I don't see that the way to go. Now, Donald Trump's uh, M.O. for everything is, before he negotiates with you, he smacks you in the face. Sometimes that works. Uh, I think New I, York real estate, it works. In New York real estate, it works. Maybe it works with Kim Jong-un. Uh, uh, maybe it works with Xi Jinping at first. But you can only get away with it so much. And then you've got to start being reasonable. And as a lawyer, I know you can protect this technology. So what I'm saying is, if what we have are the brightest people in the world working on so many things. And that may be an overstatement, but we've got a huge supply of those people. What are they going to do? They can't manufacture in the United States. too expensive. So they've got to look for other places. It's almost like this area is growing and this area is declining. But we still have huge amounts of valuable assets. If we collaborate, we're all going to be successful. Mm -hmm. If we don't, we're going to fight about it. And I can't see us winning. I just don't see how we can go back to being, uh, first of all, we have one-fourth of the population in China. So it's not really a fair comparison to say their uh, economy is bigger than ours. Uh, uh, if we had four times as many people, our economy would be four times as big as theirs. So, uh, and also, I don't think, does it really matter, Jay? What is the geopolitical, what are we fighting about? China's not trying to take over the United States the way 
Khrushchev was and, and, and no, free Russia. Trying to take over the world order. And, and, well, um, it, and, and that's a good thing. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's aspirational, but it's visionary. And if they realize their dreams on this Belt Road thing, the, the world order will be changed in their favor. And, and that's, um, I, I hate to say, it's a, that's, that's not a win-win necessarily. I mean, it's a win-lose. You think they, we lose they, something? If when they, when they become... take over the world order, we lose. Why? Because what do we lose? We are going to be marginalized. We are not going to have the same markets. We are not going to have the same welcome, welcome mat in so many places. And, and this is because we shot ourselves in the foot. It isn't necessarily because of anything they did. They're just steaming down the and, track, and, and we're standing still. One of the big things that's going to happen is they're going to stop using U.S. currency as the only uh, a measure it's for coming. completing transactions. It's, it's going to start with a basket, and then who knows where it's going to go. Yep. And, and, and that's been propping up the U.S. dollar for forever. So when the U.S. dollar gets cheap, uh, in some ways it helps you. Now you can make more goods. And, but on the other hand, for consumers, you can't buy things anymore. You can't travel. You can't buy the same kind of foreign goods. So I one, think, of, one of Trump's negotiating points where he's going to meet in Florida with Xi Jinping soon, yeah. uh, is that he wants them to increase the value of the relative value of the, of the RMB. Yeah. Because he thinks it's too cheap and it hurts us, you know, on a um, you know, trade basis. Um, but in fact, you know, that's not really the problem at all. <laughs> that's a make-believe problem. Well, if it hurts us on a trade basis, it helps us on a consumer basis. Exactly. And so who are we... Who, who are our warriors in this battle? Are these multinational companies like uh, uh, Walmart and, and our car manufacturers? Are they even American companies? And, and, uh, uh, I, and where are they going to be in 15 or 20 years? So well, that's the big question. And China, you know, thinks ahead 100 years. And yeah. they are, this whole project is with that in mind, celebrating, for example, the 100th uh, anniversary of the creation of the, the PRC, 59, right? 49. In, 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 for, sorry, 49. And so uh, 100 years after that, there'll, there'll be a big celebration, and there'll be metrics and achievements to, to match the 100-year birthday. So the other thing I, I wanted to go to just before we, uh, we break here is this. Uh, you know, you describe a picture. We have described the picture together here. It sounds like the U.S. is not only on a track to the wrong place, but it has been on a bad track for a while. Mm -hmm. China, you know, with all its issues and the uh, what I call the potholes in the road, they're yeah. still moving down the road and they're right. doing pretty well at it. Could it be that we've we, we've already lost this? Could it be that it's too late for us to regain the primacy we had all these years since the Second World War? Uh, could it be that there's really nothing much we can do about it? We might as well enjoy the loss of our leadership. Could it be? Yes. Yes. And is that a bad thing? Wouldn't it be better if, it, if the leadership around the world was balanced? We're not going to go out of business. We've got so much going on here, and we're still powerful, effective around the world. So if we share it, I think that's a lot better than us dominating. And, and if we're going to fight with China and let everybody else go to them, now all of a sudden we're, we're standing alone. But if we collaborate with China, we collaborate with Europe, now all of a sudden as the world order economically changes, we become an important player in it. Maybe not the dominant player. But maybe our dominance is not so great it's, anyway. It's waned. It's the way things go. Yeah, it's the way things go. You can't keep... I mean, every empire, the, the, every, the American empire is at a, at a completion in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So what it's time for now under Trump, but probably not going to happen under Trump or under his successor, yeah. is a new foreign policy that recognizes what we've been talking about and that tries to create a, a denouement, a harmony yeah. uh, between what they're doing, what we're doing, and try to avoid the hostility, the contention, the trade wars and, and all those things that lead in the wrong direction. We need a new, a new and comprehensive foreign policy that is realistic uh, and, that, and that covers all these points we've been talking about. That now. is exactly right, Jay. And if we could do that, then I think we're better off and the world is, is better off. And we've got to stop thinking in terms of enemies and allies. You know, we're all in this together, even Russia, which, you know, has its real serious problems. But... 
uh, there's no chance we're going to war with China unless, uh, unless we do something insane. I mean, they have everything to lose, we have everything to lose, and nobody has anything to gain. Right, and, and climate change will claim us all. So why are we, so why are we spending umpty um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions? Why is half of our budget on military that isn't even going to uh, be worthwhile? I mean, the, the real military problems have to do with ISIS. So I think we need a complete refocus. And we need to stop saying, and, and, and there's been this huge backlash against the way uh, uh, Trump's administration is doing it. So maybe the backlash will produce just what you're talking about. We need to look at things realistically and honestly, and we need to get, uh, get off this mindset of what's in it for us. We're number one. You know, uh, one more, I like to say this. Uh, um, we're out of time, so I can say anything I want. Green, <laughs> Green Bay Packers, uh, Vince Lombardi. He changed the motto of the country from to winning isn't everything, it's the only thing, or what backwards. <laughs> right, it that. used to be, doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. Yeah. That's where we need to be. Yeah. We need to be playing the game instead of trying to dominate everybody else. From your lips to God's ears, Roger. God's right in the room with us. Uh, yes, Roger Epstein, <laughs> <laughs> attorney, traveler. And global economist, thank you so and much. And good friend of Jay Fidel, thank <laughs> you. Thanks.